Turn the book of John, if you would. John chapter 19. I really enjoyed that. Hear the hearts of, of men as they cried out in song. It's not scripture, but certainly you can hear the inspiration of the scriptures in every word. Sometimes they quote it. Sometimes they just sing from what's in their heart. <clears throat> All of these old hymns speak of our Savior, and I love it. John chapter 19, I'm going to read about a chapter and a half here. Follow along in your Bible, if you will. Talking today about the atonement for your sin. John chapter 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plotted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate there went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith to Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate to him, Speakest, not, speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth, and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And they said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, 
and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother, and from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was in high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man laid. There they laid Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Chapter 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths laying, yet went not he in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they had, they knew not the sepulcher, that he, or sorry, for as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I knew not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith to him, Sir, if thou have borne him thence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, 
Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend to my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. As I mentioned, I'm talking about the atonement for your sin. Here in the Gospel of John, we have what is best described as the Gospel tract of the Bible. You don't believe, you can turn the page over, chapter 20 and verse 30. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, but these are written. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The whole purpose of this gospel message written by the one whom Jesus loved and penned and recorded and written was that ye might believe. He's addressing us today and any that would look to this gospel and read through it. They are written to the end that ye might believe and believing you might have life through his name. Amen. This gospel tract which if you're not familiar with the word tract is simply a short writing, dealing formally and systematically with a subject. <laughs> Read the Gospel of John, and how, how formally does he go chapter by chapter and chapter and systematically lay out who Jesus is and what Jesus did and show how Jesus went from being born into this eventual end that we find. Here the Gospel is presented systematically and formally what I best believe is the gospel tract in the Bible. The best thing that we often look to when dealing with people is that book of John and show it to them. It reveals plainly Christ and the salvation that he offers. Look back in 19 and verse 30, chapter 19 and verse 30. What an amazing verse. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now that statement, it is finished, I'm going to show you in this very gospel what he's talking about. And it would be so if, if John indeed is trying to present to people how they would be saved. I believe everything that pertains unto gospel salvation through Jesus Christ would be in this very book. He need not go anywhere else. He would contain it in the context. That makes sense. So it is finished. Let's look at that in context. It is finished. What is finished? Go back to chapter 4 and verse 34. Chapter 4 and verse 34. John chapter 4 and verse 34. It says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. It is finished. Chapter 5 and verse 36. Look with me there. Chapter 5 and verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. It is finished. He cried from the cross. Chapter 17 now, in verse 4. Chapter 17 and verse 4. John chapter 17 and verse 4. Jesus says in verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In verse 4 says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. John chapter 19 and verse 30, Jesus received the vinegar and said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What's finished? His work. 
What's finished? His works. What's finished? The work that God sent him to do. It's finished in that moment. Christ declares it plainly. Finished, finished, finished. His work, the work. Now talking of the gospel specifically, what is the method? What is the mode? What is the moment of the atonement of our souls? We're going to discuss today what reconciles us to God. What made that provision? How do we receive reparation for our sins, which are so many? How can we make good on that? How can we break even with God and receive reconciliation? If you were to look over in 1 Corinthians, you can go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Very famous, very famous. You may not need to. We have in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church, and this chapter in particular deals heavily with the subject matter of the resurrection of Christ. In verse 1 he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. This is the good news. He says, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he carries on talking about the witnesses that saw these things come to pass. But the gospel then, in there, in a nutshell, is that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. But I want you to look for a moment in verse 3 and 4 there, at that saying, according to the scriptures. It mentions twice in these two verses. He says, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And it says, and that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And based on this internal evidence, and what I'm going to show us further on in this study, that indicates to me God is highlighting according to the scriptures on two portions of this complete gospel message. Because he specifically says it in tagging that Christ died for our sins and that he was he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He doesn't tag that same saying or give, give affirmation of the presence of the scriptures on that portion he was buried. You can see that. And I believe it was intentional. So then my understanding, and I will develop this, is that Christ's death for our sins will be highlighted by many scriptures. That Christ's resurrection from the dead the third day will be highlighted and emphasized by many scriptures. And that burial, absolutely necessary. That, that burial, a portion of the scriptures, and important to the gospel message. But... It seems to me to be presented as a segue that does not have the tag according to the scriptures. And therefore, we might be weary about making firm affirmations of scriptural doctrine when dealing with he was buried. Right. That's what I see. Amen. Whenever I go to make a doctrine, I, I, I emphasize in my heart and in my mind the same thing that we learned in Deuteronomy. Except there be two or three witnesses, you, you don't make a doctrine. And so God says, he says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established and time and time and time and time again I've seen the Lord Jesus Christ do that in his word. If it's a doctrine, salvation through belief, you'll see, believe, 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 believe. i got hundreds of witnesses to that. Right? But you know what cults do? They take verses out of context. They'll give you one scriptural witness and they'll say, this is doctrine. And the worst of them take that doctrine and make it an issue of salvation. And when they do that, they're, they're, they put themselves at liberty to rest the scriptures before men. 
Why? Because they have one verse, and then they're going to take here a little, there a little. And this is the favorite saying of dispensationalists. This is the favorite saying of all sorts of cults. I'm going to take this verse, and this verse, and this verse, and this verse, and prove my weird niche doctrine that really only kind of is indicated in one scriptures. So let's look at the doctrine of the atonement for your sin. I believe, relatively speaking, like I said, the burial is going to be limited in the scriptural presentation. And 1 Corinthians 15 just affirms what I've found in my studies. Now, if you look in John, go back to John chapter 20. I'm not going to read it all again. We already read it in context. But what I want to show you is the proof of what I am saying here. According to 1 Corinthians 15. According to the scriptures, he died for our sins. Uh, according to the scriptures, he rose again the third day. And absolutely, he was buried in the middle there. <clears throat> so what you find in John, this is the gospel of the gospels. This is John trying to lead people to Christ, that believing they might be saved. It's the whole point of him writing this book down under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. You'll find the death burial, and resurrection in these chapters that I just read. The death goes from chapter 18 up until chapter 19 in verse 37. Verse 37 gives affirmation, and verse 35 before that, that in him acting the way he did leading up to his final death, he fulfilled scriptures. A bone of him shall not be broken. They shall look on him who he has pierced. Verse 35, he says, And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith is true, that ye might believe. This is the whole point. Again, he's, he's highlighting that. Jesus died, cried out, it is finished. And this portion, this chapter, in, in, in the majority of it, up to verse 37, is talking about the death of Christ. 18 through 19, verse 37, is leading up to his, his ascent to Calvary. 77 verses here. The burial portion you're going to find in the remainder of that chapter. Verse 38 and down to verse 42. Where he was taken down from the cross, prepared, wrapped, and wound in linen cloths. And finally in verse 42, there they laid... Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher, was nigh at hand. There is the burial witness to Jesus Christ in John chapter 18, 19, and 20. You have five verses there. Now as you turn over into chapter 20, you are going to find the events that follow Christ's resurrection. We know that because Mary Magdalene immediately comes down, and in that very first verse, sees the stone taken away. For fear, she grabs the disciples. They look in, and they find no Lord. His body is missing. He's gone. He is risen. Amen? Amen. They haven't yet figured that out yet, but that's what happened. 56 verses. Okay, so the death, 77 verses. The resurrection, 56 verses. And the burial of Jesus Christ in the gospel message has five verses discussing it. Okay, so that is a second witness to what I believe I'm seeing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. According to the scriptures, his death. According to the scriptures, his resurrection. And lots of evidence, lots of witness to that. From John here in particular. The burial, five verses. Segue from one to the other. Equally important, of course. He has to be buried. He has to, he has to go to that tomb for three days and three nights to fulfill the scriptures, absolutely, so that he can rise again, triumphant. That had to be a part of the gospel witness. But again, be weary when taking that and making a whole bunch of doctrine out of it. Right. Be weary even more so when you take that and you apply it to salvation with crystal clear um, emphasis when it's simply not there. And this is what I'm getting to. When it comes to the burial portion and the specifics of it, 
Okay, I can go to verses here and there and everywhere, not just John chapter 20 in these five verses, of course. There's other verses in prophecy. There's other verses in, in the writings of Paul that talk about that time. But it definitely isn't given a 1 Corinthians 15, which is known as the resurrection chapter, where the Apostle Paul is just glorifying and talking about and discussing and emphasizing the resurrection of Jesus. The burial doesn't have that. So with respect to the specifics of the burial, you have people that believe that Jesus went to hell. You have people that believe that Jesus went to the grave. You have people went, that believe that Jesus simply went to heaven at that time. You have all sorts of various beliefs about that time period. And I will say this, there's all sorts of great men that are on each side of these discussions. Because I've studied it out, and I've seen the scriptural proof for Jesus going to hell for three days and three nights. I've seen the scriptural proof for Jesus simply resting in that grave for three days and three nights. That's a little lean, but I, I can see why people might believe that. I see the scriptural proof for simply Jesus ascending up into hell at that moment for three days and three nights. Or ascending up to heaven, sorry, for three days and three nights. There's good men on all sides, and honestly, in my Christian life, I've been on all sides of this. Why? Because it's, it's just never been crystal clear what happened in those three days and three nights. I've never just been able to nail it down and say, yep, this is exactly what the Bible says, because I don't believe it's that clear. Yeah. What happened those three days and three nights? You know what's important? Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. Amen. Yep. And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what you need to believe. That's what you need to accept and trust. Amen. The finer details, hey, he was buried. Good enough for me. What we have these days, and in recent, recent moments, and recent hours, is this idea of a hell atonement. And this is the danger. This is the rub. This is the problem. Okay? So I said it's already... Unclear what happened during the burial portion. Right. So why would you take something that is unclear and make it a pivotal doctrine for salvation? Even labeling it an atonement portion of the scriptures. Why would you do that? Dangerous at best. Wicked more likely. Okay? And again, I have from my mouth said, Christ died on the cross, descended into hell for three days and three nights, paid for our sins, and rose again triumphantly. I have said that. I've never believed that hell was where the atonement was made, but I have been sloppy in my presentation of that. Absolutely. I lean towards Jesus descending into hell for three days and three nights, but I do not believe that there he burned and paid for my sins. The hell atonement is wicked, false, ungodly, devilish doctrine. And just in singing these hymns, though they're not scriptures, what is emphasized from the saints of old? The blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Nothing gets my heart warm. Nothing gets tears in my eyes like the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. The blood and his death on that cross is where my sins were paid for. That's right. This hell atonement is wicked. It's garbage. Throw it out. <clears throat> now some in presenting the hell atonement doctrine will say that that first Passover was a type of Christ. Okay, Go back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Please bear with me. Get up, stretch your legs if you need to. I'm going to walk through this as... as, as Concise as I can. I got lots of Bible. And we'll get us all out of here in a good time. And hopefully we'll be strengthened as a result of what we hear today. That first Passover, Amen, was a type of Christ. <clears throat> One of many we find in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 20, 12, Exodus chapter 12, I'm not reading the commandments here, Exodus chapter 12, my apologies, 
And in verse 3, the Bible says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the house be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden, at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hands, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And so here we have the Passover, one without blemish and without spot. We know Christ as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was to be without blemish. He was without blemish, without blemish, and that's why this Passover lamb was taken from the flock and kept up for several days to make sure that it did not fall upon um, an injury or, or, or uncleanness or anything like that. It was kept in store for the day that was ahead. And when that day came, they killed it in the evening, they took the blood, striped it on the doorposts, and in that house they then ate the lamb. Now here's what they'll say in regard to the hell atonement, and this as a picture of Christ. He was roast with fire in verse 8. Verse 9, roast with fire. Not raw, not sodden, not at all with water. Roast with fire. Verse 10, he straightly commands, he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. So the provision was made, if some did remain, burn it with fire. So we have these suggestions made that because the lamb was roasted with fire, because the lamb was burned with fire, because what was left over was to be consumed with fire, therefore Christ as the Passover for us must have been burned with fire in order to fulfill his sacrifice unto us. Now, in dealing with Jesus Christ as our sinless sacrifice, He is the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that He was blank from the foundation of the world. What's that little word there? Yeah. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. No reference then to burn. In the foundation of the world. He was slain. And so, in the same way that the Passover here cleans, or, or allows for them to be saved from the judgment that is going to be coming, the lamb was slain, the blood was applied, and therein lies your application to Jesus Christ and where the atonement comes from. Verse 13 makes it clear. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. 
Don't get distracted by what is making atonement for the people here. It is not the fire and the consumption and the cooking of the lamb. It is the blood that makes atonement. It is the blood that is the token upon the houses. It is the blood that when the death angel goes over and he sees the blood, he passes over the people that are within that house and will not destroy them. They're cleansed of the plague. When I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. We just sang that. Look where the atonement comes from. It's not from the fire. Right. It's the blood. What we need to understand in dealing with types in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, is every single type eventually comes short. I've heard people say that Jonah is Christ. And he's this perfect type of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Just think about it for two seconds. Okay, so, so Christ was a disobedient prophet that refused to preach the word, ran away from God's will to the other side of the known world, and hid there. He needed to be thrown into the belly of a whale in order to get right with God. And even when he finally did what God wanted, he pouted about the results. Come on. Yes, types can be picked out of the examples that are set forth. David as a wonderful type of Christ. And other great men of God as types of Christ. But it falls short when dealing with men for the sin that is in us. I can be Christ to people. By what? Loving my neighbor. Right? But would I say that I'm now a type of Christ and perfect in my image of him? <laughs> Not even close. We need to understand that every example of Jesus falls short at some point. And this is no different. The Passover is no different. So we need to look to what God is highlighting here in this passage, and that is the blood. It's clear. The blood is the token upon them. The blood makes atonement for the soul. The blood causes the plague to be removed from them. They are not destroyed as a result of the blood of the Lord's Passover. Now, if I was to look to a type that reflects Jesus and his suffering, and Jesus as, as his sacrifice, I wouldn't look to the Passover, per se, though I can glean from it. And definitely learn some great things about blood atonement. What I would look for, and that is the New Testament institution of a similar ordinance. What do we have there? The Lord's Supper. Mm. Now, in the Lord's Supper... What does Jesus present? This is my body broken for you. This is the blood of the New Testament shed for many. Where's the fire? If it's part of the atonement. It's the blood. It's his broken body. It's his sacrifice on that tree and on the cross. I'll just read it. Turn to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9. Near the end of your New Old Testament. In Leviticus 17, verse 11, it says, It is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. We can't be any clearer. It is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. The blood, the blood, the blood. Now in Zechariah chapter 9, I just wanted to segue a little bit into my dealings of the New Testament, Zechariah chapter 9, a, prov a prophetic book, a lot of things that are, I believe, dual in their, um, in their uh, sorry, fulfillment. You'll find fulfillment in the time of Zechariah. You'll find fulfillment looking forward to the, the time when Christ would return. You'll find fulfillment in Zechariah's prophecies about the time when Christ came the first time. In Zechariah chapter 9, <clears throat> In verse 9, the Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Sion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So we know that this is a picture of Christ's triumphant entry. Amen. The prophet makes declaration, Lo, your king cometh. He's not going to be what you expect. He'll be lowly. But he's bringing salvation with him. Verse 10, it says, And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, 
and he shall speak peace to the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river even unto the ends of the earth. What I believe this is showing us here in Zechariah chapter 9 is simply a transfer that's going from the chariots and power and horse of Jerusalem to them losing that, the bow being cut off as he speaks peace to the heathen. As Jesus Christ came and his own received him not and he looked unto the heathen and, and went after them in, in regards to salvation and opened those doors wide open. But it says, His dominion shall be from sea, even unto sea, and from the river, even unto the ends of the world. Now look at verse 11. It says, As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit, wherein is no water. What he's talking about here in regard to the blood of the covenant, it's that that was made with Jerusalem, with the daughter of Zion. He's coming to release prisoners from that pit where is there, wherein there is no water. And what pit is that that he would be releasing them from? That's hell. You can go to Luke chapter 16. But I just want to look at that. What is he saying? He says, the blood of the covenant is what releases the prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water. It's the blood, again. <clears throat> There's more to that. Zechariah is a deep book. But if you look with me down to Luke chapter 16, and it's going to give a little bit more indication of the pit where there is no water. Luke chapter 16, and verse 19. <clears throat> Luke 16 and verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So whether this happens all the time or this is a one-time opportunity, Lazarus was specifically seen in this, in this good place with Abraham. The rich man died and was buried and immediately lift up his eyes in torments and saw what could have been. Now it says in verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. He is tormented in the flames of hell and seeks only for a drop of water to cool his tongue. Here is the pit that has no water in it. And the flame burns forever and ever and ever. But Abraham said, verse 25, Son, remember that thou in thy life receivest good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now is he comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, watch this, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he say, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. And so you see here that the, the, the credence to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the, the rising from the dead that, that Abraham was asked to provide for him, is nothing if it's not for the testimony of the Scriptures that affirmed that this was coming, the promise that was made that would one day come upon all men. That's Christ. How do we avoid hell? By looking to the law of the prophets. How do, we, how do we look to, how do we get out of hell? By looking to what the scriptures testify of. Hear the law, hear the prophets, according to what it said in 1 Corinthians 15. According to the scriptures. 
That's what we need to look to and believe. Acts chapter 10 and verse 43 says, To them gave all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remissions of sin. So if people are trying to break up an Old Testament covenant from a New Testament covenant. They're missing the fact that God affirms that the Old Testament law and prophets were constantly giving witness to the same fact that Christ died for their sins and whosoever believes in him shall receive the remission of sins. Now what are we believing in at this moment? We're believing in, I believe, Christ and His finished work. We're believing in the atonement that He made for us. We need to believe. We need to trust in. Go to Romans chapter 3. We need to believe and trust in and have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3. Neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. They need to believe the law and the prophets. They need to believe according to the scriptures. Romans chapter 3, look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So God's righteousness is witnessed by the law of the prophets, and not only is it witnessed by them, Paul's saying it's manifest. It's plain. It's here. It's present. Verse 22, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Your God is saying that you're made just through his righteousness. You receive his righteousness through the justifier, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. And you receive of that by faith in him, not only that, faith in his blood. Whom God has sent forth to be the propitiation, to be the substitute, to be your payment through faith in His blood. That's plain. Christ and His blood is what we are looking to by faith. In verse 28 it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And this is what he's trying to highlight. It's not of works. It's not of deeds. It's not of being a good person. You are made just and justified and righteous through God. How did God bring it to us? Through the blood. How do we receive the blood? Through faith. I don't think this is new to anybody. Chapter 4. Look with me in verse 3. For what saith the Scripture... Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And it is the faith of Jesus, it is the faith in his blood that has you counted righteous what God here is showing us. Now, this is an interesting passage here. Because when you look at verse 4 and verse 5, he's contrasting here. Verse 3 just says, God was believed by Abraham. And when he believed God, it was counted unto him for righteousness. And a lot of people will look to that and say, well, Abraham didn't understand this and that and that doctrine, this on the death, burial, resurrection. He didn't fully have the grasp of that, but it's plain. Abraham gave God what he wanted from him, and that was belief. That was 
faith. And it was good enough for God to account it unto him for righteousness. Yeah, right. In verse 4, it continues on. It says, Now to him that worketh. We're going to try to have God help us with this now. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So when he's talking about working here at this time, he's talking about the deeds of the law. Verse 20 of the previous chapter says, Therefore by the deeds of the law... There shall no flesh be justified in his sight, but justification here comes through Jesus. Why? Because he is the justifier of him which believeth in him, giving faith to his blood. Now, working or deeds is doing, achieving, being, and eventually results in boasting, doesn't it? Yes, amen. When people are... Giving their works to God, they're saying, I have done this, I did this, I have achieved, I have, I have successfully done X, Y, and Z according to your law. Now, God here in verse 4 says that if you're working, your reward is not reckoned of grace. Take grace and put a big red X over it. Your reward is reckoned of grace debt. And that's what's given to you as a result of your works. Right. Debt. You're not gaining anything, you're losing. You're getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. But, verse 5 is now going to contrast that. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In other words, everything that he just talked about, about the substitution, the propitiation, the application of the blood by faith in Christ, through his forbearance, through his righteousness, through his justification of us, is received by believing on that same one that justifies the ungodly. One is saying, I'm godly and I can do this and receives debt. The other one is saying, I'm ungodly, I can't do this, I need to receive of your blood right. in order to have my sins cleansed. So you either work and receive debt, or you believe by faith and receive righteousness. Amen. And that's plain. You either work and fall to debt and eventually pay that, or you believe and receive righteousness. And this is the message of love. We've memorized it, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. <clears throat> but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so God proves his love toward us as we are sinners, and understand of that, Christ died for us. Verse 9 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It's by his blood that we're saved from wrath. You escape the wrath of God, amen, through the blood. Amen. By amen. his blood we are justified, just as if I had never sinned. Right. Washed clean. By his blood you're saved from wrath. You know, think about this. Because the, the, the teaching is that the, the wrath of God is, is hell and fire. And they're saying we're saved from that by him going and paying for that. But here the Bible is highlighting the fact very clearly and very plainly that it's his blood that saves us from wrath. And this is what we need to grab a hold of. The only way you escape the wrath of God is through the precious blood of Jesus that was shed upon this earth. When Christ died, he was dying that death of the cross. Not some other death. Not some second death. The death of the cross. Now, the penalty for our sins has to be paid for. And this is, this is the reasoning that comes out that I've heard with regard to the hell atonement. Doesn't the penalty for our sin have to be paid for the same as we would have to pay it ourselves? Remember, if I'm working and thinking that's going to get me to heaven, I'm going to receive debt... Ultimately, I'm going to receive death and hell that follows with it, okay? Now, does Jesus then have to cover up that debt by going and paying for it in the same way? 
I would say no, and here's why. Jesus didn't just pay off our debt. He went beyond that. Okay? We don't just break even with God. He went beyond that. Remember Christ died for the sins of the whole world? Not only for our sins, but also for the sins of all the world. The whole world. There is an abundance of grace. Because most people won't even receive of that grace. Christ didn't just come and say, you've committed X, Y, and Z. I will forgive you of that. Pay it off. You're free of that debt. No, he went beyond that. And this is what is highlighted here. Romans 6 is awesome. Romans 6 and verse 23 concludes that matter. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. Okay? So, my wage, another way that we put that is the debt that we do for doing my own works. Most of my works are sin, unfortunately, before salvation and after salvation. The wages of my sin is death. Okay? Death, then, is what we earn. It's our wage. It's also a debt that we owe. And it's death. The Bible just said, To him that worketh is the reward reckoned of debt. So what you receive as a reward for working your way to heaven is just debt. That's your wage. That's your death. Ultimately. Now in contrast here, he says, But... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we know that Jesus tasted death for every man. Right. Okay? But that isn't and can't be just applied to the death that we deserve for our sins, for our debt, for our wages of sin. He tasted death for every man, but I don't believe that necessarily means he had to succumb the death of hell to pay for our sins. Why? Because at that moment of transaction, we approached Jesus not to have him pay off a debt for us. We approached Jesus to receive a reward that's reckoned of grace. Look, I wasn't looking for a reward of debt. I wasn't looking for a reward of, you know, cleaning my slate and getting me back in even with God. I was looking for the reward of grace. And this is going to be the difference here. We approach Christ looking to receive the reward that is reckoned of grace, not the reward that is reckoned of debt. So, the penalty, or... The reward for me, for my sin, if I hope to reckon it or make it good myself, absolutely. If it's of works, it's death. Just like the rich man. Mm -hmm. In hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment, eventually would go to the second death, which is the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. That is the reward for me, if that's the way I'm hoping to enter in. If I'm, just, if I'm just hoping to make good on my debt, balance out my karma, make sure everything is... I'm doing more good deeds than bad deeds. All I'm getting is debt. All I'm receiving is death. And that's the end for me. <clears throat> now, the reward or the penalty for my sin, if... I hope rather to receive the grace of God, is reckoned of grace and the gift by grace. And what is the gift? It's eternal life. Amen. It's not just emptying out that death penalty. It's literally receiving life. These are two different things. And I, this, this thing came to me, and I may not develop it perfect, but there is more here. You can just dig in, and you can just study. But what I am finding here in looking at Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 is it's not just, well, either I get this or I get that. They're literally two different things. Christ was dealing in life. That's all he had was eternal life to give. The Bible says, if I receive the grace of God and the gift by grace, that gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
If I hope to, by my own works, receive of a gift, it's debt. And that debt will have to be paid for eventually, and that is me going to hell for all eternity. Now, if you look in Romans chapter 5 again, and in verse 18, he's going to talk about this. What Jesus gave in exchange for my sin was not just was was not just him paying my debt. What he gave in exchange for my sin was eternal life. Amen. He gave his eternal life for me. He gave that literally and freely to me. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and that is how I receive forgiveness of sins. I don't need to receive forgiveness of sins getting those absolved and taken care of. I just need to receive of eternal life, and that kind of just washes it away anyways. It's a different in fo focus and mindset. Romans chapter 5, and verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the obedience be, that the offense might abound. Now look at this. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Mm -hmm. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace reigns. Eternal life reigns. It rules. He's saying here that where sin abounds, and we think this world is so awful and sinful and wicked, and I was so awful and sinful and wicked before I got saved. Each one of us has a past that we regret, and we've done things that we don't like, and we're so glad that God forgave us of those sins. Amen. Where all of that sin abounds, where all of the murders and fornications and adulteries and lasciviousness and wickedness and ungodliness abounds, grace did much more abound. It's no thing to grace. Grace abounds above and beyond that, and that is what the free gift is. Our reward is reckoned of grace, not of debt. That's resolved. That will be wiped away. There's no impact of sin upon this world anymore if the world would just look to Jesus Christ and His blood atonement for us. Grace reigns, verse 21 said, through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. His eternal life is what rules and reigns if we will receive it. So then, what he gave in exchange for my sin is eternal life. He didn't just pay some debt back. He just gave life. Right. What saith the scriptures of this life? The life is in the blood. I would say also the eternal life is in the blood as well. Eternal life was in Christ's veins. It's in the blood. Just as the life is in our blood here. That's what gives us fleshly carnal blood life. Even so Christ offers eternal life and that life is in the blood. He says if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. It's the blood that cleanseth us. The grace of God, the gift of his blood, then, abounded so much more than my sin. That David says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And so at the moment of me receiving Christ's gift of eternal life, which he always had, He's always been an eternal, life-giving God. When He gave that to me through His blood, and I received that the moment that I did, my sins were not something that then needed to be atoned for, fixed for, paid off. God just simply forgot them. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed my sins from me. And now He just looks at me and sees that same life that was in His Son. Amen. And that is... The blood atonement. That is the substitutionary atonement. 
He gave his eternal life. His eternal life is in the blood, and that's what was shed for me. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read through some scriptures here. Galatians, Ephesians chapter 1. I don't want anyone walking out of here. And you may have beliefs about what happened in the burial portion of the gospel. Death, burial, resurrection. There's all sorts of beliefs about it. You know what? After this study, I haven't exactly nailed it down, what I believe happened in the burial portion. But I have nailed down that it was not paying for my sins. It was not making atonement for my sins when Jesus was buried. That happened on the cross. Amen. I'm going to read some scriptures that make that very clear. It's the blood of His cross that make the atonement for me. And if you haven't received the blood of His cross for atonement for you, you've got to get saved. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. Ephesians 1, chapter 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Isn't it great to stand before God accepted? Mm. Verse 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His graces. Look, it's not even out of His grace. It's not like He has a measure of grace and He needed to pick off a little portion for you. It's according to His grace. His grace is abundant. Where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. It's exponential how much grace that God has in contrast to the sinfulness of this world. And we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. We're accepted in the Beloved through His blood. Amen. That's good news. Ephesians 2. Amen. Let me read in verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So if I was dead and I'm not now because I've been quickened, then that throws away that doctrine that death is always hell, doesn't it? Right. You hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Look to the context. Death is what you were stuck in. You were in trespasses and sins. That was the dead state before God made you alive by his eternal life. Verse 2 says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our, t our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. And that's true for all of us, especially if you were saved later in life. You did walk according to the course of this world. You did walk according to the prince of the power of the air, that spirit that worketh in this world and in the children of disobedience. Verse 4 says, and I love when he does this, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. That wonderful gift of God. We'll continue on in verse 13, it says, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now we can get close to God. Now we can get close to Jesus. We were afar off, but now the blood has made us close. It says, For He is our peace, who hath made both one. We have peace with God through the blood that forgave our sins. Colossians to the right in chapter 1. Colossians in chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Verse 9, Colossians 1, verse 9. <clears throat> for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. 
who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Paul wants great things for his believers. And he says that God translated us. He moved us from the spirit of darkness and the power of darkness into the wonderful kingdom of his dear son through the redemption that is in his blood. And that's where our forgiveness comes from. He says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, verse 16, for by him we were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through what? The blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of what? His flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am also made a minister. What is he highlighting here? The blood of his cross. Reconciled to us, or reconciled to himself by the blood of his cross. We were alienated. We were full of wicked works and our mind was removed from him. But we're reconciled through the body of his flesh where that death took place. He says there in verse 22. In the body of his death. In the body of his flesh. Through death. That's where he presents us. Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. It's the blood of his cross. That's where you find your redemption. Hebrews chapter 3. <clears throat> so how can you say your redemption comes? How can you say your forgiveness of your sins comes from some sort of hell atonement? Hebrews chapter 13. My apologies. Hebrews chapter 13. Let me read a few verses here. Jesus Christ, verse 8, the same yesterday today and forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. In verse 9, here's a good warning for our day and age. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. By grace are ye saved through faith. Grace was the gift of God, which was eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, which came by way of His shed blood the sacrifice he made there and not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein and here he's contrasting those that are going to have the reward reckoned of grace be established by grace and those that would be reconciled with meats which is only going to produce more debt and death and problems for them he says here that they have not profited them that have been occupied therein in meats and drinks and diverse washings and the works of the law and the cardinal ordinances. You want to enter in that way, you'll have a big debt to pay when you reach the end. But Christ has eternal life waiting for you and it's established by grace. Verse 10 says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest are burned without the camp. So here now, he's going to compare the altar of the old with the altar that we have, that they have no right to serve at. They have no right to be partakers of or eat at that altar. Those that are established with the meats of the altar, that has not profited them. We need to profit in that good thing of the grace of God which he gave us. So those took those bodies without the camp and burned them. He says they were brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin. Indeed, they were offered for sin. And then they were burned without the camp. Now here, compared to Jesus. Verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, 
that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now, when that sacrifice took place in the Old Testament, and the blood was shed, and the atonement was made for their sins for a time, now the blood of bulls and goats could never atone for our sins fully, when that took place, and then the bodies went and were burned without the camp, did they suffer at that point? There's a little bit of humanistic reasoning. They've already been sacrificed. They've already been destroyed. They've already had the blood shed from them. Then the bodies are taken and burned without the camp. I don't see suffering taking place there, but it's going to highlight this here. He's comparing verse 11 now to verse 12. The blood is certainly brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin. Then the bodies of those beasts are burned without the camp. Therefore, in comparison... Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. What happened without the gate was suffering. And without the gate, we read it in John chapter 19 and 20. It was the death of the cross. It was just without the gate. The Bible talked about how many people saw that writing that was on the cross because that was an entranceway. That was a prominent place of the city. It was without the gate. There was a garden there. It was an easy place to bury things. They weren't in the middle of the city. They were out the gate. And in that same place is where Jesus sanctified the people by his own blood and suffered without the gate. That's where it took place, in the gate. Now why do then people take Jesus is suffering and put it down into hell. That's not without the gate. His own blood he gave in sacrifice for us. He suffered without the gate in that same time period. Let us therefore go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continue, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices is God well pleased. So he's saying that since Christ went and suffered without the gate, and died on the cross, and shed his precious blood, that he might sanctify us, he says, therefore, go. Bear that reproach with him. Suffer with him. Have people beat you and mock you and spit upon you and treat you poorly. But also, by him and his same sacrifice, sacrifice to God by praising him continually, giving thanks to him through his name. Do good unto others. Communicate. In other words, distribute what you have. Those are the sacrifices that are well-pleasing to God from us. Is the life well-lived and the power of the eternal life that Christ gave. But that original sanctification came by the blood of Jesus Christ, His precious blood. To the right we have 1 Peter in chapter 1. 1 Peter in chapter 1 in verse 2. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Your elect through sanctification of the Spirit and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, it says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed by corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by the tradition from the fathers. In other words, your vain works, your vain doings, your vain efforts, those corruptible things is not how you were redeemed. He says, but, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. It's the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As a lamb slain, without blemish, without spot for you. Reject the vain tradition. Reject the corruptible things and offering them before God, but receive of the precious blood of Jesus. Why? Because he was foreordained for you. And then manifested himself in these last days. And he shed his blood. And verse 21 says that God raised him from the dead afterwards and gave him glory as a result, that your faith and your hope might stand in God and God alone. That's why he did these things. 
Now look, even in Peter's outlining of this, this gospel message, he says, the precious blood of Jesus is what redeemed you. And then he says, believe in God that raised him from the dead. All these men had great opportunities to give lots of scriptures that highlighted the burial. If indeed the burial is, is this, this atoning work of Jesus, if the burial is where the sacrifice was made for our sins, I think they would have brought it up. Peter just ignores it altogether. It's given. It's granted. Of course, if Jesus shed his precious blood and was raised, he had to die and then descend into the grave, into hell, and whatever you want for that time period so that he could raise again. Of course, amen. I believe that. Yeah. But that's not where my sins were atoned for. <clears throat> Let's not limit the blood atonement. Don't limit the blood atonement. Amen. By applying it to other portions of the gospel message. Don't take away from the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Don't limit the blood atonement. We're not Calvinists. We don't believe in limited atonement. Right. <laughs> don't conceive, then, of some hell atonement, ultimately out of your own foolish thoughts and imaginations, because that's what you have to do. You don't have clear verses. You have to take examples and types and pictures and shadows and put them all together into your own imagination and come up with this doctrine that Jesus Christ paid for your sins in hell. It's not true. It's blasphemous. We've just read scripture after scripture after scripture. The blood of Jesus Christ, the sprinkling of the blood makes reconciliation. Your, your salvation is through the precious blood of Christ as a lamb slain without spot and without blemish. So don't conceive of some hell atonement based on your own foolish thoughts and imagination. You're in a lot of trouble if you have. I, I, I have personally presented the gospel wishy-washy on that. Mm -hmm. But I've never believed in anything but the blood of Jesus Christ. His shed blood and His sacrifice on that cross and on that tree for me. We need to be careful. Jesus was forsaken of all his friends. Jesus was beat, whipped, mocked, spat upon, lied about. He was taunted. They finally put him on that tree after, after this, this near-death beating that came upon him, the hands of the centurions. Crown of thorns placed upon his head. Mocked and lied about before all. <clears throat> Jesus was put upon that tree. He was nailed there. He hung there. There the blood poured down off of his body that the Bible records was, was marred more than any man. I believe he was barely recognizable as a man. But a, a mass of flesh and blood. And the, the most amazing thing about Jesus' death on the cross for me, and, and I came to this realization as, as, a, as a newborn Christian, and, I'm, and I've, I've thought about it a lot, and I'm thinking about it even now. And, and I'm, I'm ashamed that I even, I even lended thoughts to Christ's suffering being primarily when, when he descended to hell for three days and three nights. I, I reject that, Okay? I never thought it was atonement for me, but I definitely thought of, of that suffering as the ultimate. <clears throat> what I've come to think about when Christ is on that cross is the fact that he could have made it stop at any moment. Jesus said, do you not believe that I could send forth legions of angels? Now, it may be true that some people have suffered in this life, Severely, through various torture methods that men come up with for interrogation, for just malicious cruelty or whatever reason that men come up with for, for hurt and harming people. It's true that men have suffered. But the thing about Christ that really grips me is how he was forsaken, mocked, beaten, spat upon, ridiculed, just, just destroyed and taunted. 
And he could have made it stop and did it. Legions of angels could have made it stop in the moment. It's like Jesus had his finger on the button to make it stop. Now any one of us, if we were being tormented, and we had the power to destroy all of our tempters and just simply get down from the cross and be good and okay and fine, we would have. But Christ, for the love that he had for me and for you, and even for the tormentors that were saying, if thou be the Son of God, get down from there. He went through it. And died, though he could have made it stop. To me, that's the, that's the greatest picture of sacrifice. When you can make it stop, and you go through it anyways. So he let the blood come down. So he let his breathing slow. So he let the, the whispers continue as, as, as his light, his eyes began to dim. The mocking continued. He asked for a drink of water. He said, Behold, I thirst. And they gave him vinegar. Imagine. He gave up the ghost. And there made atonement for you. He died for you that death, even the death of the cross. The Bible highlights over and over and over again. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and of things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, this is new to me, but there is, there is a new thought, a new movement I'm seeing of people's thinking and, and pushing at making that cross of Christ of none effect. You can go to 1 Corinthians. Making the cross of Christ of none effect. By giving the atonement unto some other act. Dividing up the atonement. Taking away from the blood. Taking away from the cross. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Have not God made the foolishness, made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in wisdom God, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jew a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of this world and the things which are despised. God hath chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him are ye in Christ Jesus 
who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in God. And this is the problem. is Men's wisdom has taken over. And we, we've applied all of our logic to the preaching of the cross. Of course it's foolishness to the world. And of course it's those that are perishing that have rejected it. We're saved by the power of God and the power, power, wonder-working powers in the blood of the Lamb. Yet that preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. They have some other way. They have some other sacrifice for themselves. We preach it all the time at the door. If you're counting in anything but Jesus Christ. Right. Now we know His precious blood. You're perishing. Amen. We're going to go to 29 in our hymn books. We'll sing one, and then we'll get on our way. Praise the Lord for that wonderful, wonderful word. Amen. Number 29, at the cross. <clears throat> Receive my sight, and now I am happy all 